Hello and welcome to this episode of How to Be a Great Game Master. Although whatever you hear here is for your ears only, and if it was to get into the general public's attention, we would have to make sure that you were very seriously disciplined as we are talking about how to run a political game. Political campaigns are often tricky because, well, they're political which means lots of intrigue, lots of plots, lots of double dealing, lots of double crosses, and lots of table crosses too. Now, there was the question on the uh, website www.greatgamemaster.com on how to run a political game. And I decided not to handle it as a setting, although it is a setting, because it can fit into almost any setting that you uh, have. Politics is always going to be with us. We always have a difference of opinions, and we always have people trying to manipulate those opinions to their own. How do you run that as a game? First and foremost, political games I find run best with smaller parties. It's difficult trying to juggle multiple characters with multiple political allegiances in multiple directions at the same time. So a smaller group is one of my recommendations on how to run a political game better or to have one character play the political game and the rest of the characters play the support role. Traditionally, when you watch a political-based film or TV series such as, say, House of Cards, you have one character who's playing the politician, the politicking individual, and then the others are providing support, digging up dirt on opponents, trying to foresee traps, trying to avoid problems, and to advise their political candidate, or at least their uh, individual who is involved in this political game. So I would look at that, and I would talk to your players. If they want a political game, chat to them and say, do you want to represent a political entity as a group? Is it going to be one person and you're the bodyguards? How are we going to work it? And then you're going to be run running basically a split campaign where the actions of the politician, although they might be purely linguistic uh, dalliances and combat is limited to mind combat as in outmaneuvering your opponents, and your bodyguards are limited to physical combat as well as some psychological combat, bear in mind it is almost a split game, but it's an interesting split because what happens in the one affects the other and vice versa. Whereas in a normal party split, someone's shopping and someone's digging in the basement of some noble's house. They often don't reflect upon one another. So there is that interesting aspect to the political game and to the split within a party within a political game. So how do you actually run it? Well, this comes down to a main plot. As usual, have your master plot running in the background so that you know exactly what's happening. But that master plot needs to be centered around something that will have a political influence. So if your campaign is set in perhaps uh, ancient China and your houses are vying for control of the empire or perhaps for forging the first empire, what is the master plot? The assassination of the family that's most likely to become emperor? Is it perhaps that there is an army that's being built so that there will be a military coup and then there's no point in all of this politicking? If it is politics on a galactic scale and you're trying to save your planet from some evil empire that's trying to destroy it and you need the support of your council, well, perhaps that's where the master plot will be. Is that why is this council, this evil council, or this evil empire trying to destroy your planet and why is the council not stopping it? There's political machinations at work there. You need to go and find out what they are. So you have your master plot, but it doesn't need to be too specific. It can be broad strokes. This entity, this galactic fleet, wants to achieve this. They want to obliterate a certain race. Why? All those kind of reasons you can develop on the fly as you go through the game. Once you have your master plot, you then need to figure out who are your key players. Is it factions? Is it a specific entity in a medieval type of setting? Is the king an individual or is it a cloister of monks who are represented by an individual, but behind him sits this council of elders who are actually calling the shots and the individual that you're dealing with is merely the mouthpiece. So you need to identify some key players. In this drama, 
I will have this key player who represents for, who represents against, who represents neutrality, who represents total chaos. Figure out your key players and then kind of keep them on track. It allows you, once the characters are starting to interact with the story, to start to form alliances, to break away from those alliances, to move in different directions. By having key players, you can control a lot of the way that the game unfurls. Now those key players will then translate obviously into NPCs. That's what this game is all about. It's about NPCs. So it's about keeping those NPCs in a way that you can then use them. And there's three broad categories that I would recommend that you use NPCs in. The first category is the NPC ally. You need to have allies. Your heroes must be able to turn to certain individuals who are doing everything in their power for almost no reason, almost no reason, everything in their power to support and help the players and their characters. It's very important that you have allies for them and those allies don't betray them. And there's a reason for that is because the second type of character that you need to have is your hated NPC. And the hated NPC, and this is where it becomes critical, the hated NPC is the one who actually is going to help the PCs right at the end. The hated NPC is the one who goads them into doing something irrationally and then who manipulates them into doing something that they don't want to do. But because the hated NPC has some dirt, has some information over them, it causes them to do it. And then ultimately, very, very much at the end, we discover, oh, actually, the hated NPC was helping us all along, but needed to keep up the pretense of being hated because the true enemy was watching him or was following him. A classic example of that is Snape from Harry Potter. We all thought he was this evil, diabolical creature, and it turns out he was the most noblest of them all. So we need those kind of characters to, to enliven our world. Then, of course, we actually need the enemy. And the enemy can be cunning, they can be blunt, they can be brutal, they can be conniving, they can be every little piece of evil, twisted shred of humanity that you can dredge out of your GM soul to make them this entity. And perhaps they're slimy and they'll sit at the table and they'll negotiate with the PCs. But right at the end, they'll raise a point that what would happen if they didn't go along with the plan? Because they're not going to unless the PCs acquiesce on a certain point or change their minds or support another initiative in the Senate House that needs to go through which doesn't appear to have any link whatsoever to what the PCs are after, but ultimately they will find it is linked. And now that's where you start to get to the tricky part of the political game, of the politics. Every action that your NPCs take should have a goal. I want the PCs to agree to help me now, and in return I will help them. That's the standard reci reciprocal, reciprocity. That is the standard way that politics works. I help you now, you help me later. I won't tell you what you're going to help me on later, but you agree that you will eventually help me. So I will help you pass this small deal and then I will ask you for a favor later on. That becomes quite complicated, so your note-taking must be flawless. You have to keep your entities listed and what their goals are and what they've done for the players or what they expect the players to do for them in the future. If you don't, your players are going to run rings around you. As you try to remember, was this the senator who agreed to the grain shipments and supporting the new agricultural reform? Or was that the NPC who agreed to decimating the orc populations? I can't remember. Again, having fewer players means you have less plots to try and juggle and to try and remember because you're playing a whole bunch of different political factions who are working for and against one another. Because it is a kind of setting though, we have to look at what our players expect and that's pretty much everything that I have described in this video so far. They expect backstabbing, they expect conniving, they suspect support from unlikely sources, they expect that they're going to have to make deals. So you have to give them deals to make. What that means is that you're not going to charge headlong into the giant campaign uh, politicking straight away. You're going to start your NPCs off as lowly individuals. Perhaps they're assistants to a greater 
politician, to an admiral who needs to sway the mind of the uh, commanders of the, the, the galaxy. Perhaps it's a scribe and you start to overhear things which you may later on learn and use to your own political career. Start your players off slow and start them off easy. Simple plots. You overhear that the chief wants to requisition 300 bulldozers to flatten a village and that senator wants the village to be saved because of this reason. Let your players start to help. Either one, let them find clues that start to lead them into the story. And once they've proven themselves worthy of playing the political game, then you can start to give them slightly bigger plots and slightly bigger plots until eventually they're part of one of the big players. And they don't have to be very high level for that. They don't need to make huge roles to persuade their fellows. This is not a game where you will be saying, oh, I want you to roll a persuasion check. This is a game where you say, persuade me that your idea is better. A politics game is not a dice game. A politics game is a word game. And that's the only reason why you would play it. And if your players say, well, I'm not very convincing, but I, can I make a persuasion roll? You can say, yes, make your persuasion roll. But you need to tell me what you're trying to persuade this person to do. And you need to tell me how you're trying to persuade them. Do you have any background dirt on them? Do you have any kind of information whatsoever that they might be seeking that you can offer in exchange? If the answer is no to everything, well, you have disadvantage on that role, or yes, you can roll it, but you need a very high number in order to succeed. Encourage your players that this is a game about finding out about things. And then you as the GM need to keep track of everything that you've given them because as you give out clues that this politician likes that kind of alcohol at parties but doesn't like that kind of food and then they serve it specifically because they've gone across the sea to go and find this rare food that the senator likes, you need to report, reward them for that kind of activity. You need to make sure that the players realize that as much effort as they put into listening to all of the clues that you're dropping down, they are in interpreting and embracing, you need to do the same thing. You also need to pick up on the players' backgrounds and their stories and work out how your politicians that are working against the players are going to find that information and are going to use it to their own advantage. You've got to be as conniving as the players are. So a politics game is a very interesting game to play. But again, is it a long-term campaign? Well, maybe it is. Maybe it's a couple sessions. Maybe it's 20 sessions. Will it last for years and years? Perhaps. Personally, I don't see how it could. Some of my favorite memories are a political game that I ran, and I think I've spoken about this before, but it's a good opportunity to bring it up again, was a game where I had two players, and one was the heir to a particular clan within a uh, oriental kind of setting, and the other was his bodyguard. The bodyguard had to keep him safe from all kinds of assassins and things that he knew nothing about, because whilst he was sipping tea, the bodyguard was busy struggling with the assassin outside. At the same time, he was trying to negotiate a marriage between a beautiful creature and a slovenly senator who would then give him his vote in the house to get his family raised up a status or to keep alive a castle that was de designed to be taken apart or whatever it was. And for three sessions that ran beautifully, three or four sessions that ran beautifully, and not a dice was rolled. Not a dice was rolled. Then they decided to go to war. They rolled one dice, which was an initiative dice. They failed that, and they got shot to death by archers. They had been so focused on political maneuvering that when it came time to actual combat, they really didn't have much in the way of a plan. And because they were trying to prove a point, unfortunately, they got the point, and so ended the campaign. Politics can be really fun, but you have to make sure that you have given the players as much rope as they need to hang themselves with. You've given them adversaries that are intelligent and beguiling, but also, and here is the final point that I want to make, you have to give them victories. Don't always have the Senate vote against them, even though that might make a little bit more sense. Sometimes have the senators go, you know what, those poor guys have been pushing and pushing and pushing and haven't got anywhere. This is such a minor issue to vote on. We're going to vote in their favor. And then have some sycophants come running up and say, well, you got that vote, you can get more. I think I know who you need to talk to. So have people who hook them up, because sometimes the players won't know who to turn to. So literally have those allies come forward and say, well, I liked your speech. I think you should go and have lunch with uh, Captain So-and-so, because he really needs some help getting a fleet assembled. And I think you might be the man to do that. 
you do that, I'll help you in your little quest to get that planet named after yourself. I don't think that's too much of a problem, but we need that fleet first. So that's the point. Politics is about making deals, breaking those deals, bringing deals to the fore when they've been forgotten about, and just having a lot of fun. I hope this has answered your question on how to run a political game. If it has, hit that like button. If you want to see more or hear more, hit that subscribe button. You can join us on Patreon, or you can join us at www.greatgamemaster.com, where you can leave comments and questions, and hopefully get your questions answered in a video very much like this one. So from a boiling hot South Africa, I wish you and your players the very happiest of gaming. Thank you.